Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much to the witnesses for their um, testimony this afternoon. Uh, I get to say, like so many others before me, if I've seen further, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. And uh, we have had a occasion in these hearings to hear from many people already, and you have each added to their testimony, and uh, that adds a great deal to our thinking. Uh, we share, I, ours is a tradition of deep concern for ethics and human suffering, the notion that people would be dying because of something we would get wrong would, I think, make all of us be very, very careful to do the right thing. So we are totally committed to doing the right thing uh, here. Uh, ours is a study enterprise in this case, not the decisional one. We can't adjudicate life or death for anybody, uh, but we can uh, think hard and uh, that we will do. We take pleasure in doing that. We have a a lot of uh, people here, uh, sleeves rolled up, excited to work hard on these issues, and uh, saving lives would uh, would really be wonderful. Um, Médecins Sans Frontières has committed for years so many professional uh, hours and, and uh, other resources uh, to saving lives uh, as doctors. And of course, as doctors, one of the keys is uh, the Hippocratic Oath, first, do no harm. So, sounds like we should start there and figure out whether we're hearing things correctly from the panel. It doesn't sound like anyone's saying the act of patenting is causing a harm. In fact, it sounds like people are saying, if anything, the act of patenting and um, the inventing and developing and downstream distributing of drugs might in fact all be mitigating harm. So that sounds like a, a, a rousing uh, consensus of uh, enhanced uh, human existence rather than suffering. Um, yes, there seems to be agreement that those actions seem to build upon the shoulders of many giants, in some cases government funding of basic science, and in some cases, capital formation around contracts and property rights. But uh, I don't think, at least I've heard the so-called pro-property side of the uh, debate make the case that property rights alone are causing the outcome uh, that is good, good creation and good delivery. They seem to be arguing that property rights are helping. Uh, they seem to be making the case that Lots of things could help. So it sounds like one of the linchpins of the conversation then becomes some of the, uh, if you will, down in the weeds details of patent law. As a, a former professor of this stuff, that's always fun for me to get into. I uh, recognize that unfortunately the only major healthcare um, problem that often can address is insomnia. Uh, but uh, maybe we should, you know, try to do that. Uh, so, so I wonder, uh, at least in the post-hearing submissions, if the different parties uh, here could um, follow up with a discussion about what um, has been mentioned as the enhanced efficiency uh, standard or enhanced therapeutic standard, what has also been referenced as the evergreening standard, and, and if you could, in your post-hearing submissions, uh, each try to explain um, how uh, something could be um, uh, totally duplicative of pre-existing stuff, which is to say merely evergreening or um, not of enhanced efficiency, and yet at the same time, um, be of need. I mean, it, what I have a hard time understanding in this space is it, if the old stuff is as good as the new stuff, which makes the new stuff not patentable, why is everybody knocking off the new stuff rather than selling the old stuff, which is now off patent? Um, so if you could follow up a little bit and just explain in some detailed ways about 
uh, who's, so the, the numbers don't seem to be adding up on that, so one side may be able to shed some light. That would really help. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so just briefly, please, Mr. Mahoney. Well, just, just as a clarification, it's it, uh, quote unquote knocking off, it's not really knocking off the new stuff, it's that the additional patents um, are created to, um, as a barrier, basically. Oh, yeah, no, 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 I understand that. I guess what I mean is uh, stopping me from doing something that's just as good as something I otherwise could be doing doesn't really bother me. If I can do the old thing just as well, it wouldn't matter to me whether you have a patent on the new thing, right? But you can't. I mean, uh, if you take a maximum, for instance, it, it naturally occurs in its salt form 30% of the time. So by filing lots of additional patents on top of the original patent application, um, you essentially create a thicket that then prevents generic competitors from entering the market. Um, the fear of litigation and the penalties, which can often be troubled, can. Oh, sure. So, so please, I, 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 this sounds like a real problem. So I just, oh, okay. I, I'm just, I, I'm not suggesting that it's not a real problem. I'm just, I don't understand it. Just to understand in more legal detail. Right? But, but you might be able to explain that in some depth, please, Mr. Love. Well, in the United States, at one point, uh, Caxol, which was not a patent drug. Uh, uh, there was a patent obtained on the dose that you used for the drug. And you could argue that if you didn't take it in the right dose, you would not get the full benefit of the drug. It was the only legal way to prescribe the drug at the time. Uh, that patent was challenged, it was thrown out, it was felt that it wasn't necessary to have a patent on that particular innovation. There was another case in Thailand where Bristol Myers failed to get a patent in the United States, but to get a patent in Thailand on the enteric coating of the pill. So the Thai government was reduced to uh, distributing the product in powder, which led to poor compliance among the patients, and it was kind of a mess. So you have these, these cases where the primary patent is probably the most important, and you have these, uh, the use of a drug for a second use, or an enteric coating of a pill or a dose, or a lot of different kinds of things like that. And sometimes you have our heat stabilized regimes, like for a uh, clicker, you have to ask yourself, in terms of what you want the patent system to do, are these sort of second generation of patents, are they really making things better or worse off for people? And I think that the problem that, that Gleevec had was that they, the product was an older drug, Trips came into effect in 2005, so they were basically trying to kind of find a way to patent a drug that, 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 that came in before the Trips obligation. Yeah, and that, again, this makes good sense. I just, it, it would help if, in the post-submission, if everybody could, who would like to, who you and others, if you could just Explain in some detail, for example, why that, I mean, why a, pan, why a patent on a bad thing hurts anybody, uh, why a patent on something that people, um, you know, that's the same as what people could do for free is, so, just, just those details are always, always helpful. Uh, also, um, uh, Mr. Love, you were very good in mentioning earlier in your, your discussion that you had participated in, I think you said, four compulsory licensing cases in the U.S. Could you provide for the record uh, the details of those, whatever you're able to uh, 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 in the post-hearing, because th that way we can read about them, understand them, uh, uh, that, that would be helpful. Uh, do, uh, and then, um, I, one of the, um, uh, questions that, that seems to be uh, on the table is uh, uh, whether the Indian uh, policies are TRIPS compliant. And, and so one, one question to follow up with in the post hearing would be whether something could be a trade barrier but still be TRIPS compliant. Uh, another question to follow up with is um, uh, to the extent, the extent to which uh, the compulsory licensing cases that have happened in India. There seems to be some agreement that there were some of them. Uh, there seems to be some debate about some of them, but to the extent any of you thinks there is one, um, uh, could you discuss the degree to which under TRIPS the licenses satisfied the Article 32 clause about reasonable commercial terms and conditions? Uh, I think I hear you making some of you making the case that it complied. If you could just highlight how it complied with that uh, provision. And again, these are I, I confess these are detailed down in the weeds questions. They're probably not well suited for 
dialogue, but they're probably very well suited for briefing. And we love reading. I love reading. Uh, I look forward to reading whatever you can submit. Uh, thank you all, and uh, I'll turn it over to the next person. Thank you. Good. Well, back in the 90s, I spent five years as the chairman of the Section 301 Committee at USTR. So I full well know the challenges of trying to figure out whether a particular trade practice is WTO inconsistent or not. And actually, one of the nice things about being here is we're not a policy-making agency, and we don't have to we don't have to answer that question. In fact, the uh, the request letter says, in the report, we do not expect the commission to make findings regarding the legal merits of any Indian laws or policies. So, in a sense, and it's an interesting question whether or not something that's WTO consistent or not is a trade barrier, uh, but. Measures do have in economic impact, whether or not they are legal to some standard or not. And I guess what I'm thinking about is, the question I want to ask is the economic impact of some of the Indian practices, and to get to Mr. Uh, Maybrook's uh, sort of issue, against what standard should we measure them? And one way you might think about it is if you look at what other countries are doing in terms of providing, say, ex access to medicine. I mean, a lot of, no, a lot of countries have a, be, a lot better health insurance laws than we do. And I'm assuming that there's a lot of these products are being uh, sold in those markets at probably lower than the list cost. At least, uh, and so is that what we should be looking at is where people are not complaining about how the medicines are being provided, being made accessible? compared to how the method the India is using. So I wonder if anybody has any thoughts on that or any, is that, would that be a valid measure or one measure we should be looking at? Okay, Mr. Shapiro and Ms. Corp. Um, if I can say, I think you really have put your finger on what is the heart of the implicit debate here. Um, as an economist, and frankly, in economics, there is no real controversy about the benefits and or the impact of intellectual property rights on innovations which have economic effect. Uh, this is something that's very well established in economics. And that, consequently, there are relationships between um, intellectual property rights and foreign direct investment, intellectual property rights and exports, uh, because the intellectual property right is what allows you to claim or claim the profit, which is the incentive for the development. Um, yeah, I've about trade capacity. I've so made that argument a lot of times. It's but. the right argument, sir. <laughs> the argument here implicitly is should not be about the value of intellectual property rights. Um, intellectual property dominates the U.S. economy today. Um, it's what distinguishes the U.S. economy from almost every other economy. It's not limited to the pharmaceutical sector, as my and, other, and the research of others has shown. Um, it's fundamental to GDP and income. Okay, okay. that's so, given. So how do we right. get to this question? So the question is, if we support, if we want access to life-saving medicines or to life-improving medications, which everyone wants, um, the only question is, how do you finance it? And the other side of this argument says, we finance it through what would have been the returns of the intellectual property holders of this. My response is, in so doing, you implicate a, lar a, a large and serious train of economic costs, both in the United States and in that country. Um, there are other ways to finance it. As you said, what happened, how is it that, um, how do other countries finance broad access? Well, they have taxes. Um, how do we finance access in very poor countries? Well, we have initiatives in foreign trade, that is governments do it. Um, governments do it in a unilateral way for themselves, they do it in a multilateral way. Um, and the way to, to me, the way to cut these, this knot between these two sides um, is, is to say there is another way other than the intellectual property rights of the people who develop these 
medications or whatever the technology is to finance broader access if in fact this is a genuine political and social consensus to do so. Thank you. Let me get this next and then yeah, I mean, I'd just like to build on that, too, because I think it is a, a, a good point. Clearly, a number of countries have measures in place that deal with the pressures of their health care system and cost and pricing. What these countries have in common is strong patent system. It's in a, uh, they also largely invest in their health systems, and I think you've heard from other members here that that seems to be a significant gap that is going on, at least in India. All those things enable a dialogue where you can come in and have a dialogue if you are um, a, a private sector industry. But what these countries do not do in addressing those issues is allow domestic industries to infringe patents at will. And I think that is why we're here, because we want to be able to be in a position where we can have that dialogue, know that there's a strong patent system, and know that the government's committed to that dialogue. Okay, but is there a difference in the I don't know whether it's the revenue that comes back to the U.S. firm, depending on how countries resolve that question. I'll have to probably get back to you. I mean, okay. every system you, is you different. I, I do. I mean, every system in every country is different. So you would, I would argue, clearly going to have differences. But in, in a, right now, the way the system is set up in India, um, you don't even have that opportunity. Okay. I'm just going to end with anything else. So the natural extension of the logic, it's, it's correct, the statement is correct that we're not here to debate generally the value of some form of intellectual property rules or system. Uh, the aforementioned, taking the aforementioned logic to its natural extension that IP fuels investment in innovation, therefore is a good thing, we accept any rule at any time that industry wrote, no matter the cost, to society, no matter the distorting effect on markets, no matter the scope or duration of the monopoly. We are, in fact, here to discuss particular standards and rules and the effects of those. And the, the rules that any given country adopts, those have economic rationales as well. They limit abusive practices. They protect competitive markets. They facilitate follow-on innovation of the next product. So I think we have to look at the particular standards and and ask that question. If there is no obligation, and in fact, if reservations are, are embedded in the rights, if, if these are state-granted exclusive rights, then there, there, has, to be, there has to be some metric for, for non-compliance, and there, there isn't one in this particular case. And I, I think that, that makes the case that's being made against India in this particular area quite difficult. I want to measure the economic impact, mm -hmm. and that's what and you said that there's going to be a different standard, but we have to write a report, which we have to say it says it's an impact. Mr. Malcolm, Bonnie, do you have a? Well, uh, and just around research and development, that that's one part of what you're trying to measure. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, almost 50% of research and development today is paid for by the public sector and by philanthropies. Um, and, and again, when you look at the innovation pipeline of the last couple of decades, most significant in, in inventions have emerged from the public sector. Now, in terms of economic impact, if you are charging very high prices for medicines in India and not creating flexibility in the system, that's money that the Indian government could be investing in basic research and development that may eventually be licensed to manufacturers all over the world that instead are being paid for high prices. We would rather see the Indian government investing in basic innovation instead of paying very high prices for, honestly, an industry that is not producing enough new innovations to meet all of our public health needs. I think the second thing I would say is this is an industry that is writing off most of the world's population. Uh, they are pricing medicines at a, at, at a rate in different countries in which most people cannot pay. So in terms of measuring economic harm, I think the real criticism has to come back to an industry that actually is unable to find strategies that actually can promote access and that can expand their markets. Arguably what countries like India or Thailand or others are doing is that they are uh, trying to create a viable market for these medicines and providing royalties back to companies that otherwise they are simply writing off. Bayer only had 200 boxes of the medicine uh, imported in, in 2012, I think, when the National Cancer Registry was showing that there was about 30,000 patients that could have used the drug. So they're not even really meeting the market needs. Thailand, in issuing compulsory licenses, actually has shown more investment in its healthcare system by doing so, by therefore then expanding its uh, overall budget for treatment for healthcare, and thereby providing revenues back to U.S. companies and others. 
Uh, will the companies make more money if they're selling at a larger volume of sales? Uh, I think our argument is yes. I think that ultimately they want to target only a small elite of the population, and we think that actually in the long term they can meet, reach a much larger number of patients, and they can also push governments, or other governments can focus more on basic research and development and high prices. These governments simply cannot pay, so to the extent that they just want to bang their head against the wall and demand they pay more, it's not going to change the circumstances on the ground. You do have to recognize the markets in which you're operating. Okay. Um, my time has run out. Uh, but posterior, any studies that we should be looking at that make the point you just made, Mr. Malfani, that would be useful. And Commissioner Pinker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I thank all of you for being here to uh, discuss uh, these very, very important issues. Um, I, I don't want to in any way uh, bracket out of the discussion the important humanitarian concerns have been raised, but I do have some economic questions and some political economic questions that I want to go over with you. Uh, first of all, I don't know that anybody's addressed this directly, although I think in that very last answer we might have uh, gotten a little bit of it. Um, I want to pose a hypothetical question, and I hope that uh, uh, you can either answer it here or in the post hearing. If India were to cover a higher amount of pharmaceutical R&D costs, does that necessarily mean that uh, U.S. consumers would be called upon to finance a lower amount of those costs, or would it just add to the overall amount of, uh, of R&D expenditures in this area? Mr. Shapiro. Yeah. Um, the, um, uh, we would expect a little of both frankly. Um, that is, you would expect some R&D would be shifted. Um, not a great deal, frankly. There, there is a relationship between foreign direct investment and research and development in the pharmaceutical sector. Much more likely to see R&D in countries in which there is a lot of foreign direct investment by U.S. pharmaceutical or European pharmaceutical companies. And again, that FDI is very closely correlated to the strength of the IP regime in that country. Um, so you would expect some of, some of both. I will say that um, uh, as countries have improved their intellectual property protections, R&D in the United States in areas which are of particular importance to those countries has increased. So for example, as you've seen intellectual property protections um, uh, improve in countries in which malaria has been very common, research R&D or malaria by U.S. pharmaceutical companies increased um, because it became a more viable market um, in a perfectly natural way. In the back, then. And then we'll I, I just want to, um, I'm not answering a question, I, I really have to push back against that comment which was just made. Uh, we as an organization um, established something known as the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative in 2001. We pay millions of dollars a year to invest in basic research and development for the diseases our patients face in the field, including malaria, tuberculosis, and other diseases. And the only reason we're getting a very slight increase or uptake in new medicines um, for diseases such as malaria is not intellectual property rights. In fact, least developed countries don't have to introduce intellectual property rights until 2021. It's because organizations like ours, organizations like the Gates Foundation and governments are basically subsidizing the pharmaceutical industry to produce these products. Intellectual property, even if you had it in those countries, would not be an incentive to develop those products. It's why we have lots of HIV medicines on the market today and not a single pediatric on the market unless it's publicly financed because poor children in sub-Saharan Africa are not a market or a target for the pharmaceutical industry. There is no relationship between intellectual property and meeting the needs of neglected patients. There, there is a lot of study out that um, takes a, uh, comes to a very different conclusion. Okay, I'd like to give Mr. Love a chance to comment on this. I, I, uh, we, we looked recently at 28 cancer drugs that were introduced in the U.S. market between uh, 2011 and, and the first part of 2013. And uh, 
The median price for drugs to which the U.S. government subsidized half the cost of the development through the orphan drug tax credit was right around $100,000. And the median cost for the ones the U.S. government did not subsidize the R&D cost um, was roughly $50,000 for the products. If you look internationally, um, it is true that if, if countries uh, spend more and the market goes up, I think that, that does increase in investment. But if you look at some of the numbers, Pharma publishes on an annual basis uh, an estimate not just of their own members' R&D, but all the global private sector R&D. It comes out to just under 8% of turnover globally. Now, for some companies, it may be higher, like 20%, but you know, if you have a trillion dollars uh, in sales, you're going to have about $80 billion of private investment. Of, of that, most people reckon about half of that is invested on products which are just medically unimportant. They're just basically new Me Too products that are designed to kind of uh, compete against existing therapies without any, any, any real great benefits. So globally, you're probably getting about a half, about 4% of turnover invested in really meaningful R&D. That brings you a system of all this, uh, all these moral dilemmas and, and, and affordability problems. What we've recommended, a lot of people recommend is that the global trade system should be about R&D, not about the price of the drug, because the price of the drug is a small part of the R&D equation. We think R&D is a thing. We also think what Rohit said is that the, what the NIH does, or what other federal agencies do, or what uh, other government agencies and other countries do is important, but it's kind of left out of the trade picture. We only look at the, the, the prices, the drugs, not public sector. So we think the trade equation should be what fraction of your GDP supports R&D. You can do it through high prices, you can do it through public sector, you can do it through innovation prizes, you can do it through a million different things. But at the end of the day, it shouldn't be zero even for poor countries. But it also shouldn't be, you know, too too huge of a, a portion that's not realistic either. That's kind of the direction I think you need to go on, because the real free riders in in, in some people's systems are probably not India, where countries where you have a minimum wage of under a dollar a day in a lot of parts of the country. But it might be places in Europe or other places like that that you may think through some combination of pricing policies or something like that, or or, or, or lack of public sector R&D, which is also an important part of the thing, don't really step up. So we think the conversation has to go from prices to R&D, and it has to recognize also that, that as countries have economic growth, they grow into new responsibilities, which are kind of like a graduated income tax, which become more important the higher their income, because when they're really poor, you do want them to have some economic development. That's the most important thing for their health, and it's also the most important thing for our economy. Thank you. Uh, for the post hearing, uh, I, I'd like everybody in the panel to look at the question, uh, if uh, the uh, uh, Indian consumers uh, were put in a position where they were financing uh, more of the R&D expenditures, expenditures uh, for pharmaceuticals, what would be the impact? Of that, would there be would would it cause more drugs to be developed that would be specific to the Indian market, uh, or to less developed markets, or would it cause uh, uh, no net impact because the real focus would be on drugs that would be uh, sold in both the developed and the developing uh, world. So please take a look at that for purposes of the post hearing. Uh, I had one other question I wanted to ask, and I, I mentioned earlier that. Um, that it uh, might have a political economic flavor to it. Uh, we're, we're being uh, uh, offered two different explanations for what's going on here with the compulsory licensing. One is it's to benefit the local producers. The other is that it's to enhance access. Is there any way to sort out what's really going on here? Is there some sort of a natural experiment or some sort of comparative analysis that would enable us to sort out what's really going on uh, in, in this situation. Everybody seems very strongly committed to their favorite explanation for this, but how can you really sort it out? In the back. In the back. Well, I, I'd say that public policy is always uh, constrained and afforded its rel relative opportunities in part by the structure of a country's commercial sector. And I, g I guess my response would be, I'm, it's not clear to me what, 
again, sort of what the basis for, for the critique is in that area, if it happens to be the case as it is, that the fact that India has an, a strong manufacturing sector and pharmaceuticals experience in this area means that they are able to provide the world with affordable medicines for all. So that's 